I would like to welcome Leanne Caldwell. Uh, Leanne is the early 202 co-author for the Washington Post. Um, she also anchors Washington Post Live. Before that, she was at NBC News. Um, and so she's going to talk to us today about um, kind of navigating various um, types of types of journalism work, types of um, mediums. Um, so everything from digital to uh, broadcast. Um, and and as we learned earlier today, Joseph, <laughs> Joseph Choi here is also uh, has that skill. Um, so maybe we'll pull you in on some of, some of these too. Great. Um, but please join me in welcoming Leanne. Hello. Um, so I'll tell you, I know a lot of you, I see you on a daily basis on Capitol Hill. So um, I feel like I don't know what I can tell you guys that I don't know, but um, we'll just chat and feel free to ask me any questions about about um, like transitioning and the difference between print, digital, broadcast, journalism. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Um, so I got into journalism relatively late um, compared to most people. Um, I didn't really get my first full-time journalism job until I was like 26, 27. Um, and it was in radio. So I started in radio. Um, I uh, worked in public radio for as a reporter for about five years and then um, I went to C-SPAN for a little bit and then I went to CBS News on their digital team covering the 2012 election um, and then and it was almost like kind of a start over job for me actually because I went from radio trying from a very small outlet trying to get more into like a mainstream organization um, and then I went to CNN to their politics digital team I was there for an hour so I was went from radio to writing for digital and then I went to NBC so I've been everywhere um, so I was only a year at CBS and a year at CNN, and then I went to NBC um, also in their politics unit, um, mostly writing for digital. And then it was at NBC that the transition to television started. Um, and then I was at NBC for seven and a half years. And in the middle of that, I transitioned from like a purely like digital person to kind of doing both to, to like a TV person. Um, and then I've been at the Washington Post for um, like nine months now. And so I kind of transitioned out of like broadcast back into print slash digital. Um, but also I have this like dual role with Washington Post Live. So it still keeps me in that broadcast realm a little bit. Um, so this is my first time at a daily, at a big daily, which um, I've always wanted to do. And so it's pretty exciting to be like, and just to jump from kind of newsroom to newsroom actually, and to see like different cultures and how people approach the news and what is important to each outlet because it differs everywhere, right? Um, and so I, will say that I have learned a lot along the way on um, um, like so much basically, not only beats and politics and covering DC, but also um, how best to disseminate that information because it's totally different everywhere. Um, for you all, all of you guys, so I looked and everyone's kind of at, at like print digital outlets. No one's in pure broadcast, right? You are. Oh yeah, you're at ABC. Oh yeah, you're at Cox. C-SPAN. Fox, okay. CBS, okay, I don't know why I thought that. So, um, <laughs> cause now that I see your faces, I remember. Um, so I, I think that it's, if you get the opportunity to switch between mediums or within your organization to work all the mediums because every broadcast outlet has a website now. Um, every single print outlet is doing some sort of video storytelling and any sort of opportunity you can get to explore and to dabble in what you're not primarily focused on. 
um, go ahead and do it for a multitude of reasons. One, because it just makes you more marketable. You can jump from different outlets, from print to TV, et cetera. Um, but also it just makes you a better storyteller and how you think about stories in different ways. Um, because you have to think about, thinking about a TV story is so different than a print story. Um, the TV, as the people who work in TV know, it is visual first. If you don't have the visual, it almost doesn't even exist, right? That's why so often it's so hard for, um, you know, s many stories that happen on Capitol Hill, for exa example, to become TV stories because there's just not any visuals for it. And that's why actually as people who work at networks probably know that it's not easy to get a story on the night on nightly news or evening news or world news from Capitol Hill unless there's a really dynamic visual um, or if it's just big news like process stories like don't make it on the big we you know if you're a Capitol Hill reporter and you're there day in day out we like love process stories and in the incremental um, not going to make it on nightly news unfortunately so um, um, I would say that being able to hone those skills in print versus TV is just super, super important. And you can practice, you can do it, you know, on your Instagram, on TikTok, throughout your stories to promote your work and do a multimedia type of element to every single story you do. Um, and the writing is completely different completely different. Um, we know that in print journalism, more often than not, and and it's kind of funny, I'm going to fully admit that like I am much more comfortable broadcast writing. Um, I started in radio, um, you know, I spent the past several years in television. Um, so the transition to print is like another, whoa, you know, it's, um, it's, I'm just much more naturally a broadcast writer, um, which is actually why also newsletter is a good fit for me because it's like, you know, short to the point, very voicey, etc. cetera. Um, but we know when print writing, you guys, you know, the inverted pyramid, the nut graph, I literally learned about a nut graph like three years ago. Um, and I also didn't go to journalism school, so I didn't learn about it there. Um, so um, the nut graph and then all of the details that you need, you need. For a broadcast story, like the details don't exist. Um, it is, you are communicating, you are talking, you are thinking about telling your mother who does, or your best friend who has, does not understand politics why this matters and what is happening. And it's very basic writing of um, short sentences, one thought per sentence, and it's paired with the visual. So it's just a completely different thought process. Um, and then um, the other, and we can, you can ask me all sorts of questions about that, but um, also wanna talk about, because in, for the print people who do television hits, um, another things that are important when you prepare for your television hits as well is that um, you can't say everything you know. People's eyes just glaze over and then they miss everything that you say. And so it's really important to think about three points that you want to make. Um, three main big points that you want to make and you're lucky if you get two of them in. And um, being okay with saying less is a really hard skill for especially beat reporters who know so much, um, but think headlines. Headlines, detail, headline, one detail, maybe that third headline in your hit if you're lucky. Um, and also when you're doing television hits, another thing to think about, which is really like strong opening sentence, strong ending sentence. So even if what happens in the middle is a disaster, 
if they ha if if you're if you have a good sentence and a strong point to end with, you're probably okay. Um, and so, uh, and everyone has different. Do you have a question? Oh, no, sir. Okay. And so everyone has different ways to prepare. Some people write out every single word that they're going to say and try to memorize that. And I don't recommend that actually because you're thinking about what you're trying to say instead of actually just saying it. But sometimes that also just helps people to like get it all out there to help them internalize what they're going to say. Um, and then other people do the bullet points and then other people only prepare that first sentence and that last sentence. And there's a huge variety of ways to prepare for television hits. Um, the key is to find what works best for you. And that might change from story to story. Are you asked to talk about something that you have covered in detail and you know the ins and outs of it? Or are you asked to talk about something that you did not write? and you haven't covered, and so you have to do your own research for it. And for me personally, when I'm asked to talk about what I cover and I know very well, my preparation is a lot less. When I'm asked to talk about something that I don't cover on a daily basis or my colleague wrote or et cetera, um, I prep a lot more just because I have to, I'm a reporter who knows who who internalizes best by actually reporting and having those conversations, not reading what other people wrote. Um, but sometimes you're gonna be asked to talk about what other people wrote. Um, and so, uh, so I think that the key for like television hits is just to find your own style, your own prep method and, um, and do the way to practice is just the way to get better is just to practice it takes reps over and over and over again and so say yes to the 5 a.m's say yes to the 3 a.m's say yes to the local television stations in the middle of north dakota if they ask you um, because it's just more and more practice and the more comfortable you get um, the better and then the more they'll ask you back um, and then for the television people um, who want to expand their skill set on the on writing, um, find those opportunities. Um, work closely with the digital teams at the networks. Um, if you have reporting, uh, to to pitch those stories to the digital teams which can sometimes be hard because there's already so many people who are covering those issues. So look for the things that people aren't covering, even if it's like something small, like a bill introduction or your, you know, something that if the pack is over here, look for the things over here because that's going to be able to get you. Yeah. Obviously, as a um, as a person who works in a in a in a broadcast network, um, it's very traditional media, and everything is focused on: is it you know is it for evening news or is it uh, a broadcast piece? Is do we have visuals? Do we? Mm -hmm. So sometimes when when we have a story um and we don't necessarily have the visuals it's like hey but it's it, it would be good for digital um we don't necessarily have a big team that mm -hmm. it's uh at digital um and they're swamped with a lot of things and all that um do you have any advice on how maybe we could navigate the fact that you know Maybe we don't have a big team at digital, but we do want to expand that. Um, how yeah. do we navigate that, you know, process of maybe pitching and writing more, expanding that uh, aspect um, when maybe there is not enough resources mm -hmm. because our network is more TV driven. You're CBS, right? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So, um, yeah, your t your TV your network hasn't built out the digital as much as like CNN or NBC, 
has, or Fox has too. Um, what's your job at CBS? I'm a digital journalist, but it doesn't, like the digital part You're like, has nothing to do like with- Like the DJ. Like, like the you, DJ, okay. yeah. And uh, yeah. actually my role does a little bit of everything. Uh -huh. um, so I do, for compared to other colleagues, I do tend to write but it's more because I do offer myself. Mm -hmm. um, but we don't have a lot of people in the digital team, especially in politics right. specifically. So navigating that aspect of like putting the reporting, because sometimes I do get sent out, for example, to the Hill. Mm -hmm. um, and we speak to senators, to representatives, and we do have valuable information about bills or, or like, I don't know, Senator Schumer said this or like specific things that are very valuable about things that are happening. Um, and that is not going to get passed on, on evening news or anything like right. that, um, but are valuable for people to know and maybe getting that immediately on digital might not be feasible. Like at CBS, is there also a divide between like the TV and the digital side? Yes, it, which yeah. is also complicated. So maybe yeah. like navigating that, it's, yeah. it's difficult. I don't know if you have any advice on that end. So, um, well, uh, so yes, um, and it's mostly relationship building. And so, do you have an editor in DC, a digital editor in DC? We do. Yes. Okay. Um, I would sit down with that person um, and try to figure out a way how and make it as easy on them as possible, right? And so a lot of times in these in the networks where there is digital and TV component, um, I understand 100% where you're coming from. And so um, try to figure out a plan with them, say, look, I know that you are short staffed. I know that you need content and I am willing to provide that content for you. How is the best way for me to make it easy on you? Um, I can give you a heads up when I'm headed to the hill and say, this is my focus. Would you like a story after I could send you a submitted story? Do you want me to send you a written pitch beforehand or afterwards that's pretty detailed of what I have? Um, I would like to contribute to the website. I think it's a really important part of CBS News. Um, and so it's more like relationship building and taking something off of their plate. Um, because a lot of times they fe do feel overwhelmed and they just can't deal with another thing, especially if you're not their direct report. Mm -hmm. um, and so try to get also um, anyone who has any sort of influence in that realm, just kind of on board and start to have those discussions. Um, because I think that it will, I think that they probably want it, but can't yeah. deal with it. And so make it as easy on them as possible and just like build those relationships. And it might take time. It's funny because I'll tell you a personal story when I was at NBC, you know, I was like, I was never like on the digital team, but I was on the politics unit. Most of my output went on to digital. And when I officially moved to the TV side, all of a sudden digital was like, uh, no, we don't want your, you know, we don't like want your stories because I'm not one of them, right? So I had to like rebuild this relationship, even though I worked with them on a daily basis because they like didn't trust me now that I was a TV person. So, um, so yeah, and it worked, but it just took time and had to build, build that trust um, again. So there are those divisions. And I totally understand what you're going through, but um, you can do it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. Um, my name is Kirsten, um, and so I'm already in the TV realm, so mm -hmm. we cover DC for more than a dozen local TV and radio stations, but my aspirations are to move towards the network level, so I guess I have more of a, not a technical question, but more mm -hmm. a trajectory question. You know, how did you kind of either get your name out there, or how did you find a way to navigate between some of these different networks? You know, what kind of helped you stand out, and also, do you even recommend maybe taking kind of that digital role that is off air, but then turns into more you know, Great on question. TV, just because I know on the Hill, I mean, folks are established. I'm not naive to that. You know, I'm not going to compete with Garrett Cage or other folks who, you know, have already made a lane there. So I guess mm -hmm. I'm trying to figure out 
how do you find your lane? Are you on TV now? Yes. Okay. So, um, coming from, Co so there's a couple ways. Um, so coming from Cox doing the national stuff is one route. Um, and it's a, it's a good route. Um, so like Hallie Jackson came through, well, it wasn't Cox, but it she was her similar. similar. Yeah. yeah. So she came through hers. Um, but she was in Baltimore, I think. Not sure. So that is one route up. Um, and very possible. Um, try to get in front of the talent people at the networks, the people who, you know, are seeing, you're always monitoring what people are doing on air. So I think you're in a really good position. Um, another route, if you also, networks really do hire from local news. Um, it ebbs and flows um, on how to make, on what networks are looking for. So um, right now NBC is going through this phase where they're hiring most of their people from local news to be network correspondents. Um, when I was there, when I came, became a TV person, a correspondent, um, the network was really focused on reporting and really good reporting. And they wanted to like compete with the times and the post. And so they wanted really strong reporters on television. Um, and so that's kind of how I came through the TV route. I was like reporter first, right? Um, and so that's a way to like, you just like kill it on your beat and that's how you get noticed and you tend to start to do television hits. And then sometimes then maybe you can come in to a network, but they're probably not going to hire you as a correspondent. If you're a print person who's a killer reporter doing television hits, they're probably going to hire you as a reporter, probably through digital or maybe a reporter on the TV side. Um, but then you have to like make those steps internally from reporter to correspondent. So that's like a longer route actually. Um, and then of course there's the TV, there's the local television news. But I think that if you're doing like tons of reporting, you know, on air reporting, packaging, um, on national stuff, I think that you're actually in a great position. It just takes time and just try to sit down and get in front of like the, um, talent people at the networks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Hi. thanks, Jess. Um, I'm Naomi, I'm with the Washington Examiner. I would be just really curious to know your thought process on like the pros and cons of writing a newsletter because I feel like there are <laughs> growing, growing sort mm -hmm. of opportunities and particularly like the digital print um, sector to, to do that. And I'm just sort of wondering, you know, I know you sort of said about the writing style, but were there are sort of other things that you considered when you, like all things that you were worried about um, when you took on this new job? Um, yeah, the cons, it's a crowded space. It's really crowded. Um, the but the reason everyone does like creates newsletters, like these organizations, these media companies create newsletters, is because they are actually money makers. Um, it's a business um, decision why they do this. Um, advertising is strong in these newsletters if you're if people are reading <laughs> and subscribing, right? Um, so the other con is you uh, have to produce something every single day. Um, even if there is nothing happening, <laughs> you have to produce something every single day. Um, so that is actually like the ultimate stress of writing a newsletter is it's always weighing on you. Like, what the hell am I going to write? Um, but I think that it's fun because it's really fast moving and coming from like a TV, like cable news, um, environment. It was like a very easy, natural transition for me. Um, so I enjoy it. Um, it's a lot of work. Um, it's a lot of stress, but, but it's fun. It's like, it's just like a good fun way. You can like be voicier. You don't have to be like at the Washington post. You also have to think about like what the bigger outlets goals are like at the Washington post, we have a national audience. And so they like the Capitol Hill team and the white house team are not doing daily incremental stories. They are doing big picture, definitive, like sweepy, like sign of the time stories. And we're able to get deep into that. We're, we're not, we're able to like cut through that and do kind of more incremental or side, side stories. Um, 
so there's lots of cons, but there's also lots of pros too. Um, and yeah, in my interview, one of the top editors was like, why do you want to write on the newsletter? And I was like, I don't know if I do, but we'll see. So, yeah. Um, so I work for Bloomberg mm -hmm. uh, and they have like TV and radio, which mm -hmm. is great like for opportunities. But I'm constantly like trying to figure out what's the best place to like, you know, get that practice like for television. Because one of the challenges that I face doing like having a print background and like doing TV and read, well, specifically TV is that like, I'm talking about politics, so I want to be accurate, but I also want to be unbiased. Mm -hmm. And I also want to come off as like engaging. Um, and that's really intimidating. What's the best place to like start practicing? Is it really good to like start off with radio where I'm just like focusing on what I'm saying um, or like TV so I can get it comfortable in front of the camera? Yeah. Um, so I think radio is a great place to start um, because you don't have the camera element and you can you can hone how you speak on broadcast because how you speak on broadcast and radio is not that different. Um, so you can focus on that. So get lots of hit um, reps in on radio and then like especially at Bloomberg like people will start to notice too, like, oh, he's good on radio. Maybe we should try him on television. Do you guys have media training at Bloomberg? Yes. Okay, take advantage of that if you're able to, if they offer it to you, and if they don't offer it to you, ask for it um, because the media training is great and it just get, teaches you like, especially from the camera perspective, how to look like, and just gives you reps and practice, right? Um, and it, it helps you along the process of figuring out your prep. So, um, and if volunteer, if you really want to do television um, hits, does Bloomberg do, when's their live programming end? They have, I think they have like live programming like 24 hours, but it's like global, so. Okay, so like do the international stuff. Ask to do the international stuff and offer yourself like overnight. Um, another option is um, do taped interviews, which, you know, a lot of places don't like that and don't do it. Um, but if that is an option is another way to practice. Um, but radio is a really, really great way to start. Um, and then when you are doing radio, remember, think of who your audience is. Like you already alluded to that in your question. Like, am I talking to an, like a really politically engaged audience or am I talking to a business audience that doesn't really understand the politics of Capitol Hill? So you have to dial it back. Like, don't go so in the weeds. Um, and so that's gonna be really important in, as you're practicing, which is part of the success is relating to your audience and understanding who your audience is. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I'm okay. Eleanor, I'm at Politico. Hi. I am like a print beat reporter and uh -huh. uh, with TV hits, I feel like what I always struggle with is like I hedge my writing very specifically, you know what I mean? To make it as middle of the road as possible. And mm -hmm. on TV, I feel like sometimes that's mm -hmm. harder. Like me explaining something the way I'd explain it to my parents is maybe not the way that I should be explaining it on national television. And so I feel like I end up speaking really slowly and like using a lot of filler words because I'm trying so hard okay. in my brain to make sure that what I'm saying is like, yeah, is is very well is perfectly framed. And so right. I guess do you have any questions for how to think about that? So always remember there's no such thing as perfection when people talk as well. Like, um, to be totally honest, I stumble on my words when I'm on television all the time. Like I just do and no one notices it actually. And like some of the my favorite anchors like stumble on their words too. And I'm like, oh, I didn't like it's fine, you know. So that was always my thing. Like, am I going to forget that word? And then it would cause me to like actually forget the word and stumble on my word. So it's just kind of do the, I, it's like so much easy. It's so much easier to say than to do. But if you do do that prep work before you're hit and then forget it, forget everything, like don't think about it anymore. Um, because, I mean, it's so lame, but it's so true. Like what people are, here's another secret. The television producers 
do not care what you say. <laughs> they are not listening to a word you say. They want to see that you are confident. They don't care if you're wrong. <laughs> like, sad but true. They really don't. Because I used to be like, I have to be, like, everything has to be perfect, like, whatever. And um, they want to see confidence and they want to see your ability to connect to the audience, regardless of what you say. So don't worry about not saying it perfectly. Don't worry about if there is a bit of more of a tone in your television talking than your writing. They're actually going to like that more. And, but also be true to yourself and be true to the reporting and be true to your sources who gave you that information. But you're allowed to have a voice um, on television and you're expected to have a voice on television. But most importantly, you're expected to look confident. And so like, folk, like, so kind of like, don't think so much. That's really good to hear. Hi, I'm Jillian. I'm way in the back. Way oh, back hi. Corner. <laughs> hi. Um, I'm with McClatchy, so totally print. Um, mm -hmm. And this was before you said they don't care what you say. But um, <laughs> uh, what happens when you get a question that you didn't prepare for at all mm -hmm. and throw it on, on at the end? And being a reporter, I'm not the type of person who's always like, can you send me your questions? Because I would never do that in most circumstances that I'm aware of. So what, what do you do when you're on the spot there? Well, first of all, you can always ask the television producers for questions. Um, sometimes they won't respond to you, but or, or they'll be really vague. Um, and they can't control the anchor either. So um, be very honest about that. You could say, if you have no idea what they just asked you, you can be like, you know what? Actually, I haven't really been focusing on that, but I will tell you this and then go into what you do know. Totally fine. Um, and you will not, it's a lot better than trying to stumble your way through it, or it's a lot better than making shit up. You know, like <laughs> it, it, you say what you do know. You do, you're like a politician, you don't have to answer their questions. I have like a broadcast background, uh, but right now I'm more of a hybrid. I do a lot of digital and, and radio and other things. And recently, one of um, the like podcast hosts wanted me to come on to the show. And I wanted to know what you thought about turning down hits because mm -hmm. it, they wanted me to talk about something I had like nothing. Like I had nothing to kind of do with, no reporting on even though um, I was like, I appreciate you thinking of me for this topic, but I don't think I'm the right person. Um, and like a month ago, they asked me a similar question. I hadn't read the article that they were talking about, but I had reporting on it so I could talk about it. Mm -hmm. So it, it just depends. And I'm trying to figure out how do I navigate these situations where I'm like, I, I don't know what to do. <laughs> yeah, I think that if you're not comfortable about talking about something that is it best serves, you have to think about what best serves you. Because on the one hand, I get it. You're like, if I say no, they're never gonna ask me again. And it, But if I say yes, I'm gonna have no idea what I'm talking about. Um, I err on the side of saying no, and just be very honest and tell them why, um, you know, if it's that reason. Um, you can say, look, I am covering this, this, and this this week, and I really don't think that I can add a lot at this point to the topic that you're talking about. Um, but thanks for thinking of me and I hope that you think about me next time. Um, especially a podcast that goes deep, like unless if it's like a 60 second thing, but podcasts are usually like 10 or 12, sometimes 30 minutes. And that's a long time to talk about something you don't know about. And so um, you, uh, I, I think that it's definitely okay to say no. Um, absolutely. Okay, what if it's not a podcast and it's like a TV hit? Would you still say no, even though like, they might I, not come back to you ever again? I would, I don't think that they will never not come back to you because you say no. If you say no every single time, they will stop asking you. Um, if you say yes six times and no once, no skin off their back, they understand. And I think, um, I think it's totally fine, especially if you're like earlier on in your career, like every single hit, you wanna get better at every single hit and you wanna 
get to a place where you're comfortable. And so I would use the opportunities to get comfortable and to get better and to get more reps on things that you know about and can um, succeed at and excel at. Um, yeah, if you say no every time, then they just think you're not doing your job, you know, and you don't care and want to do it. But if you're saying no once every, once in a while because you aren't comfortable with the topic, that's totally fair. And it's not really fair of them to put you in a position to talk about things that you're not comfortable talking about. So thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Jackie. I'm with CQ Roll Call. Um, I just wanted to piggyback off of this question since he asked it. Um, one time I did get reached out to from like a French film crew, like, and they were trying because uh, sh the shooting at Santa Fe had happened. I mm -hmm. covered that and they'd seen my um, coverage. So they wanted to talk about gun violence. Um, and then I actually just punted them off to a way more senior reporter who had been covering it for longer. I don't know if that like applies in broadcast world where it's like you like maybe you're not comfortable talking about this but like you know somebody else has been covering it for a longer time like does that idea. give you points like are they like oh thank you for that's actually a really great expert. point yeah and that's what you can do too because it makes again makes their job easier they don't have to go find someone so you're like hey but i recommend this person um and then you can tell the person that you recommended them or not, if you know, whatever that's like, you know, because it's up to that person to say no or yes too. But, um, but yeah, you can, it's like also flattering for the person to be recommended. So, yeah, I think that that makes their job easier too, which is what they like because they're trying to find people. Mm -hmm. And then you could say, but talk to me another time for something else. Absolutely. <laughs> say, but I would love to do it. Keep me in mind. This is just is not really my area at this point. Yeah. Uh huh. And I have never, I've actually never had someone not come back to me because I said no once. That's like never happened. And I start to think, I'm like, oh my God, they haven't booked me in like three weeks. Like, okay. Um, but then they come back. It's like ebb and flow of news, right? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. And my other question, um, I've only ever worked in print and digital um, and I've done like a couple of TV things for like our local PBS station that were super low stakes. So I didn't mm -hmm. feel that pressured about it. But in terms of um, doing more TV hits for people who have never really done like that 60 second hit or like we want to interview on the spot because you wrote a story. Um, what are the like rep repeating themes of like mistakes that you see print reporters do? Talk too much. <laughs> Yeah. And that's kind of why I said it at the top. And I used to have the same problem too. Like the talent people at NBC were like, man, we know you know a lot, but we don't need to hear it, you know? So, um, so yeah, I think that that's kind of the biggest thing is they just like say too much. Um, so think about, you know, as you write in a print story, like you, ex very few people get to word 1623 like most people it's like they read the top 400 words like that's what your tv hit is um and so that's that's really it i mean everyone gets more comfortable on the camera and the more comfortable you are the better you are whatever etc but like especially if you're just starting out just like keep it simple um don't overload your brain with all this information if you want to try to get out um I said three points earlier. If you're just starting out, two points, like max, be done. And it's the anchor's job to fill the time, not yours. So if they have a follow-up, like they will ask you another question. Um, and if they don't, or if they're short on time, they'll be, they'll be done. So you don't have to fill their show for them. I'm Janae right here Hi. with Deeds Van. Hi. So I have a question for you because in my, like, time working at C-SPAN and even before I've worked in different departments. I was producing as like a production assistant mm -hmm. then I switched to marketing, but I did TV hits almost every week talking about our company to mm -hmm. like no local news stations. And now I'm producing again on the editorial side, but my passion is like broadcasting. I want to go back into on air mm -hmm. and I got to randomly do that through marketing more than I'm doing mm -hmm. now as a producer. And so I'm wondering what advice you have to either 
do that in your company or like highlight to people that, hey, I do have this skill set that could be useful. Or even if you can't do it in your company, like how you can still work on those skills if your company isn't built in a way where like on air personality is their mm -hmm. strong suit. Right. Yeah. No, that's that's a good question. Um, I'd have to think about it only because I like worked at C-SPAN. So I'm like trying to think I was there for like seven months. And so I'm trying to think of like, you know, I know the culture um, and I think that honing those like on camera skills is really good in any sort of way, but then also sit separately if you're building up your editorial skills as well. Also really important. And you want to like, if you want to go, go and be more broadcast, more on the in front of camera side or just even editorial behind the scenes is producing. Does it matter to you? So that I produce now on the editorial side. Uh -huh. So I feel like I don't have the opportunity as much anymore to do anything on camera. Right. And so I'm almost wondering if not in company, like do you have advice for things that we can do outside of our job that aren't conflicting with our work, but still help us build on those skills and continue to, you know, grow in that light? Yeah. Um, also with NC SPAN, before I get to the outside question, try to find the areas where you think it would be good if they were like, hey, why don't we just have a like voice introducing this or something like that. I know that they have just a very few people who kind of do that, but look for opportunities in your production to maybe also do a little bit of that, even if for the website. Um, outside, um, that's a really good question. Um, I mean, you can pitch yourself because C-SPAN also, like so many of these outlets have like PR people who like pitch the people to TV and you also don't have like a written, a byline for people to see, right? Because you're producing. Um, let me think about it and I will talk to you after. I'll get back to you. Yeah. Hi, I'm Minnie. I work at Time. Oh, hi. <laughs> um, I so I do a little like uh, pre-taped show. It's like half an hour with another reporter. Um, it's probably much more low key than what a lot of folks are doing here. But I still get really anxious about it, mm -hmm. and it goes well every time. But especially with like the prep work, it's like a general politics show, days headlines. So it's not necessarily specific to me. Uh, I spend like half the day before prepping. I panic in the morning and I'm like reading all the newsletters and stuff. And I'm wondering if there's a, a better way to do this, uh, a limit, a time limit you put on your prep um, or any any kind of specifics on how you actually do that prep work. Um, so do you also have a producer that helps you or are you doing all the prep work yourself? Uh, just me. Okay. Um, I think that... I think that the prep is good. Um, I also think, and I, I would have to see the show, like how deeply you go into it. Um, do you guys have prompter or do you just talk? No, you just talk. Bad, we'll just talk. Okay. Um, so I, if you do the prep work, so what time, what time do you, what time do you tape? It's pretty late. It's like 10. It's, at, it's, at night? No, in the morning. Oh, in the morning. Okay. So you have your prep. Okay. So I would say... Find kind of like your zen before, whether that's like going out and getting some coffee or some tea after you've done all of your prep. Give yourself 30 minutes to just like let go of it. Go for a walk around the block. Find whatever that thing is that kind of like chills you out. And then like for me, when I used to get nervous when I was just first starting, um, like for me, I would have to literally, I would like stand there and I would have to like close my eyes in front of the camera and this would have to be like three minutes before I was going on and I would just like breathe like and not think of anything and just clear and just like calm and ground and like however you can feel like, I mean this feels like super cheesy yoga-ish, but like I'd have to feel very grounded because if you're like not grounded, you're like, it comes across, you know? And so like, I would like try to like ground myself as much as possible and just calm whatever that way is for you, whether that's thinking about like, 
what you're going to eat for dinner that night or about a great movie you just saw with a friend or if it's just like totally clearing your head or nothing. Um, try to find that space um, right before, like give yourself like there's like the bigger picture, 30 minutes of letting go and then like the right before of just calm, trust in yourself and go. Um, because you you can do it, right? They they You are doing it for a reason. They think you are good at it. So you, they keep asking you back. You are like, you know, not fired from your job. So <laughs> like... Not yet. There's no, the, so, so there's a reason you are doing it. Um, you're engaging, you ask good questions, you have good conversation, whatever that is. And so lean into that and just like try to be like yogic before. <laughs> it's not a great answer, but you'll find your like zen, you know? Um, yeah. And I'm always, I'm the type of person too who over prepares for everything. So um i can't really give you advice on that you have to like find kind of find your sweet spot mm -hmm. yeah um i'm kind of bringing it back to writing but yeah i know that the early 202 is supposed to be like some sort of analysis too and that's how we you know file it and classify it and same with post politics now and i think it's easier for me to like give an analysis when i'm speaking to radio or tv than it is when i'm writing mm -hmm. so i was going to ask you how do you find that analytical writing style for like writing it down instead of saying it out loud yeah um so that was an evolution for me um actually cnn i found like i had a, a editor mentor who like really taught me how to use my voice when i was writing um just like so incredible i'm like forever indebted to this person who was like more leanne more like you have personality use it um and then um for me to be comfortable to do it now when everything I write is technically like reporting based analysis um it come well it's funny because like my editor now is still like more Leanne like y use it more um but uh for me it was like a confidence in knowing the beat like I've been covering the hill for several years like it was just like I can point out and have thoughts based on my institutional knowledge and for me um that's important like i feel like i have to have the confidence and the prep and the know-how before i'm able to give that analysis if that makes sense it just comes from years of of me like i wouldn't be confident if i like started a new beat tomorrow and being analytical about it because like i don't know anything um it just takes time yeah Hey, I'm hey. Hannah with the AP. Um, I'm curious a little bit less about like specific mediums, um, given everyone's great questions and more about, I mean, it seems like you've had a lot of different experiences across different newsrooms. And I'm curious sort of what you've learned as you've navigated those um, changes, how you sought out new opportunities and, mm -hmm. and like just continued to grow and, and develop your career um so what what have you learned sort of um navigating new new things and and new newsrooms um i think that what i learned way too late in my career um not too late because everything's a journey and everything like time it's like whatever but um like how important the internal politics is like it's I hate it so much. It's it's like so obvious to me when I go talk to a higher, like an executive, and I'm like, they obviously seeing right through this, right? Like I want something. Um, but uh, just um, really seeking mentor mentors and navigating like the politics of an organization. Um, it's probably a lot, me I have found that it's a lot messier at television networks than it is in non-TV networks, but, um, but being willing to kind of put yourself out there internally. For so long, I was like, my, all I cared about was my work on a date. That's what I focused on. Like, I put out good work, I get seen, people will notice it, right? It's not always the case. Like, you put out good work, and if you don't advocate for yourself, there's a lot of people putting out good work. And so really advocating for yourself um, 
when you do that good work, I think is really, really important. And it took me a lot of years, many, many years to build the confidence to be able to advocate for myself. So follow up. Yes. How, you know, you, you talk about finding a mentor or building those in person, uh, in, in network or in company relationships and advocating mm -hmm. for yourself. How do you, how do you do those things? Like what, what is it? Still figuring out. Though. Yeah. No. Okay. But, but no, um, yeah. I mean, it is like asking to have coffee with an editor or, you know, a, managing editor or an executive, something like that. Building those relationships early on um, and, and yeah, it's just about, uh, people like to be asked questions. I'm standing up here like, cause I'm like, yeah, ask me more, you know? So like people want to talk and give insight and to share and to, you know, pass on their experiences. Um, and I've always been like very like embarrassed to ask like, why would they want to sit down with me, you know? But like start to do that. Um, I just think that it's way more important than I realized at the beginning of my career. Um, and like naturally it's hard for me, but I think that it's really important. And I see other people who are really good at it and it works out many times, so. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Uh, hi, I wanted to ask about um, the relations between newsletter writers and I guess more traditional reporters on like mm -hmm. say the Congress team. Um, I, I, I used to be a newsletter writer in a couple of, several months ago and um, there were sometimes like issues of like territory and like <laughs> turf wars and what have you. Um, so, so how do, can you talk about like how to avoid those trying to make sure that everyone's on the same page and communicating on that? Regard? Yeah, um, I totally hear that. Like as a newsletter writer, uh, we kind of joke that we can like, we stomp on everyone's beat, you know? Um, but a lot of it also comes from the editors and the editors like working closely with each other and, and being willing to um, talk about the newsletter writer's work and the reporters the, like on the beats work and using some of their reporting. Like we use a lot of Washington Post reporting in our newsletter in part because it's great, but also in part like so that they also feel invested in our newsletter as well. Like the Hill team at the Post is great. I mean, I just like, couldn't ask for a better Hill team um, working with them. Um, we share information all the time. We work really closely together. And like I said, it also gets back to like their audiences, their objective is different than mine. So we kind of like share information and like, it's like this web of, um, but I think that it is like, I think a goodwill thing is to use other reporters in the organization's reporting. And also, if you are working on something that is encroaching on someone's beat, reach out to them, be very open and communicative and say, hey, I have this. Um, I'm thinking of using, do you have anything to add? We would love to include your reporting in it. Or what do you think about this? Do you have any advice? You know, um, and, and it's up to the editors too, to like, to work together too. So talk to your editor about making sure that he has a, he or she has a strong relationship and is advocating for you guys. Yeah. Hi, um, I'm Savannah with National Journal. Mm -hmm. So as somebody who's worked at so many great outlets, what do you personally look for when you are maybe going to a new job or when you're in a job or what is the most important um, quality of a newsroom for you? Is it the culture, personal opportunities, or like teamwork, collaboration? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think personal opportunities, but only because it's like, I guess the culture, newsroom culture right now in the past six months has been all over the press of different outlets, right? So, cause a lot of times it's hard to tell the culture from the outside. Um, um, so for me, it's always been personal opportunity and relevance. Like, where do I think that I will be the most relevant or the org I will be 
at an organization that is relevant at the time for the work that I want to do. And, and of course, personal opportunity, like what is best for you at your, this time in your life? Like, you know, when you're 28, what's best for you might be totally different when you're 39 or 50 or whatever age it is and whatever stage in your life. Um, you guys are all young. And so you're like trying to like, like you're very work focused, I'm assuming. Um, and so kind of, I think I'm like, so whatever is just, um, I think best for you, but I think culture absolutely matters because if you are in a job in an organization where people are horrible to each other and it's like, you don't have the support of your editors or executives or um, the management is a mess, like it makes, even if you're doing good work, it just is like, soul sucking um and we've all maybe you, we all haven't but i have been in places where it's been more difficult than others so um so you know one advice that i always give to everyone though is just to stay true to like what you think you want for example, when I first started out, it took me like a lot longer to get to this level than it does some people, right? And I've had a longer journey and I feel like um, it's okay. It's been a good journey. And also I could have throughout the process when I was looking at jobs, especially when I was like in broadcast, TV, radio, when I was younger, I would get offered like producing jobs, right? Jobs to be producers. And I was like, no, I wanna be a reporter. Like, and so I wouldn't take those producing jobs because I knew I wanted to report. And I did not care about the medium, obviously. I've done radio, I've done TV, I've done print and digital. So for me, it wasn't, a bit, for me, I knew in my core what was most important to me and that was the reporting. Um, and ultimately, that's a big reason I went, left NBC and came to The Post. I thought I could do, like, get real deep into reporting at The Post. Um, and so know what your thing is and just, like, try to stay true to that. You might have to take, a, like, veer a little bit. But if you, like, always, like, keep that center, like, it's just much easier to figure out your path. Yeah. Mm -hmm as like a print reporter and you like want to talk about a story on radio or television say someone's not asking you to do it but like you are interested in like a certain program whatever is it like best to reach out to the like anchor or the producer or like the pr person like you know who should i talk to the bookers um are usually best um so each show Every show is kind of different and every network is kind of different, but there's like bookers and then there's um, for the show and then there's bookers for the network. Um, so the bookers are really great to reach out to. Um, you can reach out to the anchors and like sometimes that works, um, but they don't really deal. They try to separate themselves from show booking. They don't want to get involved in that. They have friends. They don't want to be like piss people off when, um, you know, their friends aren't on the shows. So it's like the executive producers and the bookers of the show are usually best to reach out to. I have a question and it's, it's related to something that you mentioned about, I, I do see myself as a person, like you mentioned, that focuses on the reporting aspect. Mm -hmm. um, and people tell me like, do you see yourself as a person who goes on air producing and all that? And I just, I say like, I see myself as a reporter, period. Um, and I know that, you know, seeing your background, you've moved from medium, like from TV to print to digital, like every aspect of radio. Um, as we've seen also all the like all of these mediums also have evolved um now we're seeing like tv streaming and eventually um like broadcasts little by little like a lot of people are slowly like leaving broadcast aside like evening like the traditional evening news a lot of people don't 
even see them anymore. Um, it's all about they get their news like on Twitter, on like even TikTok. Um, it's more like mostly it's more focused on digital and all that. So as someone who like in in my case, and I don't know if someone else like can also identify themselves on, on this aspect. Um, as someone who who feels that I I want to focus my career mostly because I want to report, um, is being like being in an in in a broadcast news network. Does it make it more difficult to to focus on that aspect, or is it like I don't know? I just feel that sometimes it is, or I just because you are able to do it. I mean, um. You were in the political unit and you were able to build up that digital aspect um, and build up that reporting. Um, and you did TV hits and all that. Because sometimes I do say like, hey, I can go on TV if I'm talking about topics like Arthur say, said, like, I can go on air and, and talk about things that I know of. But I just don't feel comfortable being like parachute, like, hey, I'm just going to go on air or on radio to talk about something I just don't necessarily know of just because I want to be on air or just because I want to be on radio. Yeah. And that's a lot of what some like general assignment TV reporters jobs are, right? Is to, you know, parachute in, cover a story for a day. Kudos to them. Because right. it's a total, it's a, gr it's a very difficult skill yes. set. Very difficult. Um, but if you want to, and the problem with like the net, some of the networks is there's a 30 minute broadcast, which is really only 22 minutes, yeah. right? And they have like really five people that they rely on to fill that time, like five correspondents. And then, you know, there's not that many, there's not that much opportunity for reporting um, if you're not one of those people. So I think that, you know, if reporting is like what's really important to you, I think that, you know, finding space, finding a place that you're able to do it. And whether that's a network that has a robust digital outlet um, that is willing to, that wants original reporting um, is important or advocating within your organization, kind of getting back to your original question, to be able to report and have an outlet for your reporting because that's part of the problem with just a tv network is mm -hmm. there's a lot of reporting that happens but not often an outlet because there's space is so limited yeah um and so so yeah and like you said there's a lot of ways to disseminate news now that's not just the evening newscasts and you know the new york times or the washington post there's a lot of different ways to do it so um you know, you guys are like in the early stages of your career and you have like so many places to go and so many opportunities and it'll be great. Um, it's just, you know, kind of finding and trying to get the place that you want to get. Um, but work it inside the organization. And if you don't find it there, look elsewhere. I think we might have hit a record for number of fellows who are able to get a question in. So Leanne, thank you so much. Oh.